is for giving me the opportunity to do this um, presentation. Now, what I would like to do is actually uh, simply extend um, Ian's presentation to the special case of amorphous faces. And what I want to do is um, give a quick introduction and then um, talk a little about, about these selected methods for quantifying amorphous content, which are pretty much those methods um, Ian already uh, introduced. I want to keep this as practical as possible and um, also try to give you, therefore, an assessment um, of the merits of um, these different methods um, um, as it turned out in, 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 in their practical use, and I have some conclusions to offer. So, um, what's the motivation? Of course, um, we have an increasing interest in um, absolute face amounts. Uh, Ian discussed this nicely and amorphous contents. Um, particularly in the industry, there's an increasing number of uh, materials where we need to know amorphous um, face amounts to um, determine the usefulness of materials. Uh, cement is extremely important. Min minerals in mining, uh, where we have disordered clays, polymers, geopolymers, pharmaceuticals. Now, the mathematical basis of the quantitative phase analysis is absolutely well established, and Ian talked about that, so um, I can completely skip that. Um, fortunately, uh, the basics are basically the same for phase analysis of crystalline and amorphous content. As we certainly all know, um, amorphous content can be sometimes extremely difficult to quantify. The intensity contribution of diffraction patterns is not always evident, particularly um, um, if we're dealing with low concentrations. We have broad diffraction halos resulting in increased peak overlap problem, which is um, um, one of the really major issues, and we will find it difficult to actually discriminate then uh, between peak tails, amorphous bands, and background intensities. Now, this is a point where I would like to do a quick exercise with you, and what I have here is a powder pattern, and I would like to know if you can actually discriminate between the peak and background intensity. So, um, I give you three maybe extreme examples. Um, you choose uh, that one you like most by voting, but before doing so, I quickly show you the uh, three different proposals. This here would be um, background number one, this here would be background number two, and this here is background number three. So please raise your hands if you like this background function best. Nobody? <laughs> what about this one? Thank you. What about this one? It has to happen. It is the true background. How do I know? It's simple. I calculated this pattern and added 100 counts background. <laughs> Unfortunately, real background does not look like that, so you can imagine it's even more difficult in real powder patterns. And the whole issue here is we have an enormous amount of peak intensity here in our peak tails, so that is apparent background, but it's of course not. And if you use a background like this, you will get very nice um, temperature factors, and um, this here, by the way, is the favorite of uh, spectroscopists, XRF um, and so on, because that's what they actually do, and they get through with it because um, they use calibration, so this is actually not a problem for them. So an audience um, of uh, mostly mineralogists or XRF people, the majority would have voted, actually, for this background. So I think this gives you an idea um, about the problem, and um, therefore, um, it is really important to understand what we are doing here. So in many cases, actually, the presence of amorphous or poorly crystalline phases is going undetected or is simply being ignored by the user. Information about amorphous face amounts is frequently not sought after. Okay, fair enough. Um, however, this is also a result of the both preferred but also indiscriminate use of the real felt method, and that is simply the lack of education. And um, Ian said it very clearly, the classic real felt refinement software gives us relative face amounts, and a large number of users is not even aware about that. 
Yeah, this brings me to a very dangerous question. So I've been at many pharmaceutical conferences. I, I've heard many discussions about what is an amorphous solid. I have no idea. Um, um, what I did is um, uh, I went through literature. I pulled out a couple of um, definitions which are sort of representative. Um, maybe that makes up for a nice discussion starter, and I will return home with the answer. Um, so I like to show you, for example, this one here. Crystalline materials are frequently characterized as solids with fixed volume, fixed shape, and long range order, bringing about structural anisotropy, producing sharp diffraction peaks. Now then, amorphous or non-crystalline materials are thus solids with fixed volume, fixed shape as well, but characterized by short range order, which, however, may also have loose long range order. What's that, loose long range order? At least this definition embraces, I think, um, disordered materials possessing one um, or two dimensional or lesser degrees of order, so I think that's good. Um, another um, um, definition uh, could be this one, Klug and Alexander, 1974. Everybody doing quantitative phase analysis must read this book, by the way. The term amorphous solid must be reserved to substances that show no crystalline nature whatsoever by any of the means available for detecting it. So my um, additional comments to that would be, as we all know, there is obviously no sharp dividing line between crystalline and amorphous materials. We have short and long range order um, um, terms, but they are definitely arbitrary. Uh, the ability to detect and characterize ordering is dependent upon the principles of the analytical method, but also the models being used. The conventional X-ray diffraction loses its power for crystalline material structures on the nanoscale. Diffraction patterns become broad and features are less defined. So we typically, in uh, powder diffraction, sometimes refer to the term X-ray amorphous to also make clear that uh, there are other methods which still can detect order when um, X-ray diffraction fails. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, an example here, um, this here is uh, cement with an amorphous face, blast furnace lag. And this brings us again to my little exercise. Would you feel you can safely discriminate between amorphous band and background? And maybe we have one or more amorphous faces? Would you feel that you can discriminate between the peak tails and the amorphous bands and the background? Is this here the background position? This is, um, this is difficult, and um, basically what I would like um, to, to illustrate with this is we will not really be able to succeed if we just have a single pattern without any other supporting information. Um, this can be um, elemental information. Um, maybe we have uh, the possibility to spike some um, um, other faces into the sample, get Maybe the individual face is pure or whatever, but with the singular powder pattern, I think uh, we will get exactly what Ian has shown for the um, uh, round robin, and that is pretty much arbitrary quantification results. So one way maybe to solve this problem here is if you have um, what you consider to be a pure face, maybe uh, the amorphous face, you can measure it, you can easily model it, um, you can do a single line fitting or a uh, completely empirical or, or physically meaningful bifit. All you need is a couple of peaks, the positions, number, and intensity doesn't matter. But the important point here is, and, and that is what I, I, I really want to stress, um, if I'm going to proceed with such a pattern and I claim that's my amorphous face, what I'm doing is I'm actually defining um, this pattern as that of an amorphous face. And in um, um, in, the, um, um, in the rest of my talk, um, whenever I say I'm quantifying amorphous phases with a um, accuracy, whatever it is, then I will always um, refer this to what I have actually designed as the amorphous phase, as my model. So just to show this, um, if you have now a model for your background, 25% percent amorphous phase, this is known by weighting, 67, 72, you can see it's easy to scale um, the model to the pattern, um, and we should actually get very, very accurate estimates 
of our model because the intensity contribution to the pattern is huge. There's much more intensity in, 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 in this um, peak than in all the crystalline peaks. Note also here the um, contribution of iron fluorescence. So the um, uh, glass furnace lag actually has iron in it, and as the concentration of the um, um, amorphous phase goes up, so does the background. So we cannot simply come with a very arbitrary background model and always hope that it refines nicely, because the background can be very much a function of the concentration. So it could be useful also to have an idea um, about the um, uh, background. And uh, that's just another arbitrary example um, where the um, instrument background has been measured. And you can uh, model this in exactly the same way as I did um, for the um, amorphous phase in my previous example. So here in this case, a completely arbitrary uh, single peak fit. I do not care about the number, positions, intensities of peaks. I'm only interested in the envelope uh, function here. Um, keep that, and this can then be scaled into the pattern um, as needed. I would like to um, discuss now a couple of uh, methods for quantifying amorphous phases. They're all pretty much in the context um, of the Rietfeld method, as Ian already um, um, indicated. And I've taken all this from an upcoming paper by Ian Madsen and uh, Nicky Scarlett. To quickly classify the methods I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, the single peak method briefly, and then um, um, all the other methods here belong to the category whole pattern methods. So first, the traditional Rietfeld method, internal standard method, external standard method, PONCs. Um, um, Ian already introduced all these uh, methods to you, so I can keep the basics short. And then, if time permits, um, also linear calibration model and degree of crystallinity. Um, I may skip this, though. If I run out of uh, time, you will find it in my lecture notes. A further classification of methods um, I would like to make here is um, between the indirect measurement of um, amorphous content and the direct measurement of amorphous content. In the indirect case, these methods actually first analyze the crystalline components put them on an absolute scale, and then calculate the amorphous content by difference. That's, for example, what the internal standard method does, um, as Ian described. We then also can do direct measurements, um, that is, estimate the amorphous contribution to the pattern. Um, we will use um, or calibrate uh, known standards. Um, we will include these into the whole sample analysis via modeling. This is um, what I uh, illustrated um, a minute ago. Um, but we have to be aware that uh, the ability to use these methods here um, um, relies on the ability to observe the intensity contribution of an amorphous phase to the diffraction pattern. Therefore, automatically, if you are unable um, to model your diffraction um, contribution from the amorphous content, um, uh, for whatever reason, maybe just because it's difficult uh, to see it, you will be uh, more or less stuck with indirect measurement. So let me start with the single uh, peak method. The idea is simple. You will prepare a series of standards containing the amorphous phase at known concentrations. You will obtain a measure of the amorphous component's intensity, which is related to its concentration, of course, and then you can plot a simple calibration curve. As an example, um, you will typically want to determine um, background and the peak intensity over a couple of concentrations, of course. And what this gives you then is um, the intensity, the corrected intensity of your sample representing the amorphous um, content. And um, if you look at a different example here, this may look like that. We have a series of um, mixtures with known concentrations by weighing. We uh, define one pattern as amorphous, we define one pattern as crystalline. Whatever that means, we mix them in known concentrations and we will then be able to do a calibration curve. 
Here you see the um, areas which I selected uh, to get the amorphous phase amount. <coughs> and actually here in this particular case, Mervyn Knight in Slack, uh, the accuracy is um, within 2% over the whole concentration range. What is nice about this method is there is no need to characterize all phases in the mixture. Uh, we have the potential to minimize errors related to microabsorption because we do a calibration. More than one amorphous phase can be principally analyzed, but then you will use um, uh, profile fitting. And there's no need actually to determine the background. You can do without, but if you do, then be aware that the calibration curve won't go through the origin. But that's maybe only a cosmetic issue. It's a direct method. You need access to regions of pattern which has no excessive peak overlap. It requires access to materials for preparation of standards. The method is only applicable to mixtures which are similar to the calibration uh, function. I think that's uh, um, obvious. And you have to redetermine your calibration function to compensate for tube aging and any instrument configuration changes. I will show. Um, an example for that um, later. Moving on to the uh, full pattern methods. First, uh, the traditional Rietfeld method. Um, in this case, uh, what you can do is, particularly if you have nanocrystalline, nanocrystalline um, material, maybe you know the crystal structure of the crystalline material. So this method here, or using the traditional Rietfeld method, will then rely on finding a crystal structure which adequately models the positions and relative intensities of the observable bands of your amorphous uh, compound in a pattern. Um, examples have been published um, uh, already quite a, some time ago. Uh, Amel Debye, for example, in 1995, or Luca Lutarotti uh, in 1998. What you do is you allow for extreme peak broadening to model um, the amorphous band. And um, um, important is here in this case, since this approach treats all components as crystalline and includes them in the analysis, the amorphous phase abundance can be obtained using the traditional um, Howard methodology. So you just do a classic Wheatfeld refinement. You pretend that your amorphous phase is actually a crystalline phase. You use a crystal structure for it, um, and that's pretty much it. Obviously, the same advantages as um, the Rietfeld method has for uh, crystalline samples because you do not require standards or calibration curves. That's nice. Um, more than one amorphous phase can be analyzed. That's also uh, good. However, it's a direct method. It cannot correct for microabsorption errors. Some amorphous material will not have a representative crystal structure, so you will be able to use this method only um, in, in, in rare cases. Um, and available crystal structures with long-range order may not accurately represent material which only has short-range order. And this is particularly true if you deal with glasses. Let me quickly talk about the internal standard method. The sample will be spiked with a known mass of standard material, and then you will normalize um, your results. Um, Ian went already through all that, so I think I don't need to do this again. The only thing is keep in mind the amount of amorphous material can then be derived from the difference one, which um, is 100%, minus the sum of all corrected weights of your crystalline samples. This also makes it clear, I guess, that um, if you use this method, um, your, the accuracy of, of your um, amorphous content uh, determination will depend on the accuracy of the crystalline um, components. Um, and, and I mean, as you have seen um, already uh, in Ian's presentation, this can go badly wrong. Now, the internal standard method is an indirect method. That means we can apply it if we cannot see um, um, amorphous bands in our sample or if it's difficult to characterize them. The internal standard method is enabled in many Rietfeld analysis packages, so I think everybody can um, pretty much use it right away. It has a couple of limitations, though. You can only uh, report the sum of all amorphous and unidentified phases. You cannot correct for microabsorption errors. The sample is contaminated. The standard addition process is laborious, and it is not feasible in industrial automated sample preparation environments 
And this method also relies upon obtaining a standard of appropriate absorption contrast to prevent the introduction of a microabsorption problem. So here the sort of problem is that um, everybody can use this method. It is enabled, it is just a point and click uh, in most um, uh, software packages, but it has actually really a lot of issues. The external standard method um, has also been um, already introduced by Ian. Um, what we need to do is we want to define a so-called normalization constant for the experimental setup. Um, the good thing is that this is independent of sample and phase-related parameters, and a single measurement is sufficient for analysis. However, um, um, what is actually a practical issue here is um, this method requires the mass absorption coefficient for the entire sample. Then the amorphous content is derived in the same way as internal standard method does. Um, it puts the determined um, crystalline components on an absolute scale, and it derives um, the amorphous phase amount by difference. So the, the methodology is, um, is uh, the same. Now, the um, sample absorption coefficient can, for example, be calculated from the elemental composition of the sample, um, for example, by XRF. Um, but this already gives you an idea that using this method actually um, um, requires considerable extra efforts. Um, also, um, the um, calibration factor of the um, normalization constant uh, requires regular redetermination to compensate, for example, for tube aging. And this is just an example here how the scale factor or the um, uh, K uh, normalization uh, factor here is dependent on time as the uh, tube is um, actually aging. So we're talking here about um, a time period of about 10 months and the intensity loss of the tube is equivalent uh, to about 20%. Uh, so that is important. In principle, you want to measure the, the K factor um, for each um, analysis you want to do. This, however, is certainly not a problem for everybody of you because I'm sure that um, all of you are running at least weekly um, a standard to check the alignment of your instrument. And if you do so, the K uh, constant can fall out completely automatically. So as a matter of fact, because all of you do this, you can readily use this method for each single quantitative phase analysis you are doing. It is an indirect method. It uses an external standard and the sample is not contaminated. Has some limitations, however. It requires the mass absorption coefficient for the entire sample. Only the sum of all amorphous and unidentified phases can be reported. It cannot correct for microabsorption errors. And as I um, already mentioned, the normalization constant K is dependent on the instrumental conditions. You have to redetermine it to compensate for tube aging as well as any instrument configuration changes. The PONGS method um, is or has become, it, 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 it's really grown on me. I think this is currently my favorite method. Um, again, Ian already introduced it to you. Um, I think this is, this is one of those methods which currently has um, greatest impact, particularly in industry. Um, it, it, it has allowed us to bring now um, powder diffraction into industrial areas where um, X-ray diffraction was not in use before. Um, phases with partial or no known crystal structures are characterized by measured rather than calculated structure factors. As, it's, as um, Ian indicated, you take uh, your sample and you will then measure the intensities um, um, rather than calculate them from uh, the structure because you can't, you have no crystal structure. It follows the same general form as that used in the Rietfeld method, but now includes all crystalline and amorphous phases characterized by either calculated or empirical structure factors. <clears throat> For all phases using empirically derived structure factors, ZMV calibration constants must be derived, for example, using internal standard. But in most cases, it will be sufficient to do um, only one mixture to um, define the ZMV of a sample, and then you can uh, um, um, freely use it like you would use a crystal structure. Yeah. 
coming back to the um, cement I've shown at the beginning with um, blast furnace lag added as um, um, the amorphous um, component. Now this is actually data from a round robin and um, I just want to show you um, what we actually submitted to the organizers of this round robin. Um, the um, known weights about 25%, 67%, 72%, we returned 25.1, 67.2, 71.7, 70 uh, so um, some, yeah, you know, that, that's already looking ridiculous, but that's 0.3%. Uh, percent. Um, requires a hell lot of work, is nothing you can do with a single sample, as I uh, was hoping to illustrate um, at the beginning. It is possible, however, remember, and that is very important, um, this accuracy here um, uh, claimed is related to what I have defined as my amorphous phase. And if this is not representing the true amorphous phase, I don't know what amorphous is anyway, remember, um, it, but if this is not true, then of course also this accuracy estimate is not true. But that's all I have. Now, um, what, what, what um, uh, is something you can always do if you do this sorts of, of thing, if you have, for example, a pattern of which you assume it represents your amorphous phase, try different methods, put some uh, two um, spiking phases in it, work out the amorphous content, use the external standard method on top of it, or in general, that's, that's already something actually for the conclusions, never, never ever uh, rely only on one of those methods um, um, I presented. They are so easily uh, to be combined. Um, and, and I mean, if all these methods are in sort of an agreement, you may be on the safe side, uh, but never only um, rely on one single method. We will actually um, go through the Pong's method in our little workshop on Friday in, um, in a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial. So if you want to um, learn how this is actually being done, uh, you're very welcome to join us. Ah, oh, many benefits. <laughs> the amorphous phase is included in the analysis model. More than one amorphous phase can be anal analyzed. It has the potential to minimize errors related to microabsorption when Z and Vs have been calibrated for all phases. And this is why I actually encourage everybody, consider to use the Pong's method also for all crystalline phases with known crystal structures. I mean, um, the published crystal structures, would they, um, would they actually represent uh, uh, the phases in your sample anyway? You will be always tempted to assume that um, your sample is different from the published crystal structure and if it's only uh, because it's a solid solution or whatever. Um, so you are always probably tempted to also refine um, a crystal structure so that it better fits to your actual problem. Um, why not um, actually using then um, only empirical ZMVs instead of the crystal structure? You get rid of this uh, microabsorption problem. So this is, to me, the most significant um, advantage of the Pong's method. And therefore, I would recommend to create a database with Pong's faces and such a database can be used in full analogy uh, to a crystal structure database. It has limitations, clearly. Um, it's a direct method, and what is, of course, um, um, adding additional work, and uh, that's not always nice. You have um, um, to create a standard mixture to derive the empirical um, ZMV. Ideally, this is a one-time exercise. Um, how am I doing? Oh, yeah. Um, so let me also briefly talk about the linear calibration model. Linear is completely arbitrary. Uh, nobody forces you to only use a linear function uh, for um, uh, calibration. It is initially similar to the previous methods. However, the information pertaining to the crystalline phases is discarded. You only care about your background model. Um, what comes out uh, for the crystalline phases is not of interest. The intensity contribution of an amorphous phase to the powder pattern is modeled by a single line or poly or Lebesgue fitting. That's absolutely up to you. Um, but we will only use the refined scale factors uh, to set up the calibration function. And um, this procedure is actually um, the same as for the single peak method. 
It has benefits. You can analyze more than one amorphous phase, but it has also limitations. It's a direct method. It requires access to materials for preparation of standards. The method is only applicable to mixtures similar to the calibration suite, um, uh, suite and it needs redetermination to compensate for tube aging and instrument configuration changes. So it's very, very similar, actually, to the single peak uh, method. Finally, degree of crystallinity, although I have to admit that I'm absolutely not an expert uh, on that, I still have a lot of questions here. Um, for now, the only thing I want to say is um, the degree of crystallinity method um, massively differs from the other methods presented. Um, it is based on the estimation of the total intensity or area contributed to the overall diffraction pattern by each component in the analysis. The degree of crystallinity is then calculated from the total areas under the defined crystalline and amorphous components from this simple um, equation here. So we divide the crystalline area um, by the um, intensity of the total powder pattern. The weight fraction of the amorphous material is then again obtained by difference. Benefits, more than one amorphous phase can be analyzed. The method is enabled in many software packages. Limitations, it's a direct method. If the chemistry of the crystalline phase is different from the whole sample, then an additional calibration step is required to obtain absolute uh, phase amounts. So I would um, actually now proceed to the end of my presentation and um, give a little summary. If you, if you have a look at um, this comparison here of the different methods, it gives you, I think, a very clear idea um, when you would like to use which method, but at the same time, I think it will again underline that you always want to use more than one of those for a given sample. So I've listed here uh, the single peak method and then the six full pattern uh, methods. Um, very important here is um, you can either use them for direct or for indirect um, um, a determination of the amorphous content. The direct methods, of course, have the advantage, uh, the indirect methods have the advantage that you can use them if you cannot see the amorphous contribution to your powder pattern. Um, and then there are different other properties which are important. The single peak method, for example, requires a calibration suite, and that's the same for the linear uh, calibration method. The internal standard method I think we would have guessed that, needs an internal standard. The external standard method needs an external standard. Um, Pong's a single mixture, ideally, in many cases. Um, and then it will, of course, depend um, if you can fulfill these requirements. Um, um, th th that's really an important question. Can the methods correct for microabsorption? Single peak, yes, because we do a calibration. A Riedfeld method, external and internal standard methods, no, they cannot. Pongs can, linear calibration method can, and the degree of crystallinity method cannot. So you may want to choose actually the method, um, dependent if it's able to um, correct microabsorption errors or not. Can it deal with more than one amorphous phase? Single peak, yes. Riedfeld, yes. Internal and external standard, no. They will always report the sum of all crystalline and um, amorphous phases. Um, all the other methods, again, can. So maybe this is a little decision matrix uh, you will find helpful. For the determination of an amorphous material, the problem will dictate the methods used. I, was, um, I hope I was able to illustrate that. All methods discussed are principally capable of determining of what has been defined as amorphous material in mixtures with the same accuracy and precision as for crystalline phases, in ideal cases even down to 1% absolute or better. But this here is really the important part of what has, or what um, you have defined as the amorphous phase. Limitations are the same as for um, um, quantitative phase analysis of crystalline phases and are dictated by sample properties and the analytical techniques used, um, Ian, already nicely. Um, illustrated that. The traditional Riedfeld method only delivers relative phase amounts by default. 
in the presence of any um, amorphous or any unidentified um, faces, um, the analyzed crystalline rate fractions may be significantly overestimated. Most phase abundances reported in literature obtained by the Rietfeld analysis are provided in a manner suggesting absolute values. I think this is a problem which should be addressed. When no allowance of amorphous and or unidentified phases has been made or reported explicitly in the paper, then I would always suggest to assume that the um, published values are actually relative and not absolute. Single samples do not afford the luxury of making a calibration suite, and you are also sort of lost if you have only a single powder pattern. Intensity contributions of amorphous phases to the diffraction patterns are not always evident, especially at low concentrations, and therefore, for this sort of samples, indirect methods like the internal or external standard method will perform better. When intensity contributions of amorphous phases are evident, any method um, based on modeling the amorphous bands will provide improved accuracy. So modeling of, of, of your background, modeling of your um, amorphous content is, is, is really useful. Usually you will um, need a sample of a pure material, pure amorphous material, or at least a sample where the amorphous content is high. For indirect methods, any errors in the analysis of the crystalline phase will decrease the overall accuracy. This is also important to keep in mind. You are defining the amorphous content here by difference, and if the crystalline phases have been uh, determined wrong because of spottiness, preferred orientation, or whatever, um, of course your um, amorphous content will come out wrong. Calibration-based methods will usually have the potential to achieve the highest accuracy, as many aberrations, most notably microabsorption, are included in the calibration function. But that also uh, means measurement errors of all sorts um, of kind, unless you do the same error for all samples, of course. Um, any crystalline calibration sample and standard will contain amorphous material, which, if not accounted for, will decrease your accuracy. Um, there's um, a paper coming up uh, pretty soon by Jim Klein um, and colleagues, um, which uh, I believe is really giving a nice um, idea of the problems associated to um, standard materials used as internal standards. And one of the um, important issues discussed here in the context um, of the um, SRM 676A corundum is that any material actually possesses a non-diffracting surface layer with some degree of disorder, inclusion of surface reaction products, and also adsorbed species. And such a layer can easily account for a mass fraction of several percent in a finely divided solid. Now, if this is true, then this is also true for amorphous calibration samples. They will have some crystalline samples, and so on and so on. I would like to thank Ian and uh, Nikki Scarlett I actually learned quantitative phase analysis from them. And I would also like to thank Luca Lutarotti uh, for looking at my um, uh, notes for this meeting and providing me uh, with a couple of very nice um, ideas and suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arne. Are there questions? Are there questions from young people? <laughs> All right, let's get questions from Bob Von Driel then. What, this is Bob Von Driel from Argonne National Lab. Uh, one significant comment that's sort of missing from this is that any material that has a significant diffuse scattering component that's going to wind up in the background, and as quantitative phase analysis would be underestimated. Yeah, th thank you very much. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Paul Smart from the University of Sheffield. Um, if I understood you correctly from your uh, regarding the background correction. Um, so you would su suggest it's good practice to characterize, for example, an empty capillary in a diffractometer and then just refine a scale factor if you suspect there might be an, an absorption, sorry, an amorphous phase in your sample. 
So what is, is your question actually, if I suggest to use a model for the background? Or no, to characterize for the background contribution from an empty capillary, for example, and, and then instead of refining a polynomial to fit the background. Uh, yes, um, I do. One of the examples was a capillary measurement, but um, I would um, uh, try to get an idea how this background actually behaves, particularly if you, if you have additional effects like uh, concentration-dependent fluorescence. So I would not simply um, scale uh, the height of the background, but maybe also um, check out if I want to add um, another function on top of it, which, for example, allows me to um, refine on a slope or maybe even curvature. Um, if you can do that, I suggest to do that because um, you know, it is so difficult to, to distinguish between a broad peak or several broad peaks and the background. Um, think of the um, 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 exercise. We even can't manage it properly with a crystalline sample. So if you can do it, I suggest to do it, yeah. Other questions? I, ah, yes. Just, okay, uh, one maybe comment, uh, more than, uh, about the Pong's method, and the, the, you mentioned the possibility to correct for microabsorption correction. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, that is, just exactly in the Pong's method, you substitute calculated structural factor with measured one, and the rest remain the same. So if it cannot be done by the Ritwell, yeah, you cannot do, okay, unless you construct a database in which you put also particle size, etc. But then you can do with the Ritwell and you turn up the Brindley, for example, correction. If you know the particle size and shape, uh, you do that. Yes, uh, I... Other, yeah, just, other. just an answer to that, a reply, yes. Um, I was probably not clear about that. If, if you want to successfully um, correct for microabsorption, all faces have to be treated using the Pongs. Yeah, not just one or two, but all. Yeah, but then it become like uh, uh, using a calibration curve. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's uh, mm -hmm. that's not exactly the pumps. Yeah. The pumps, in principle, you measure one calibration and you have done. Then not. You have to calibrate for all the curve. Yeah. Yeah. One backside is that is like going back to the old days where we we were doing the calibration curve. Yeah. Instead, the, the good part of the retail why is apply now is that we avoid that <laughs> big job. And the other is uh, that uh, with the retail we can then correct maybe for texture, preferred orientation, yeah, and that in the other case we know. In about the capillary problem, my experience is I will not measure a, an amorphous content using a, cap a glass capillary. Yeah, because you had a second amorphous, so better <laughs> not to use that, yeah. The only little um, add-on from my side, uh, respective the Pong's method would be you can um, um, refine the preferred orientation as well. So there's no problem to, to um, have a um, much to large or spherical harmonics function combined uh, with that model, yeah. I would jump in and add that if you want to do this in a capillary, and you're concerned about correcting for the capillary, you have to use the same damn capillary, because there is such a variation between capillaries uh, from, from the same bottle that, that uh, there's very poor quality control of those things, at least the ones I buy. Um, I'd like to jump in with a do we, have, do we have announcements? There's always someone in an orange scarf coming up with announcements. And I don't want to cut into the coffee break if we... Uh, I think there's no any special announcement. Just uh, be quick. Uh, 